Hey everyone, Brendan Snyder here. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me and welcome to the worst albums from the biggest bands, part one. There will be a part two to this. It's gonna to post tomorrow, so keep an eye out for that. Eventually, there will be a link in the description if you're watching this later on after both have posted. But for this, we are gonna talk about 10 of the worst albums from the biggest bands. We're gonna go from A through M in this video here. And these are all bands that really hit uh, the big time, made some of the biggest albums in all of rock, making it all the way to the top. But along the way, they sure did make a few clunkers. And boy, are these things scraping the bottom of the barrel. They just, the mighty have really fallen in terms of these albums here. So join me as I run through 10 of the worst albums from the biggest bands. But before we get started, if you're new to my channel and you haven't already hit the subscribe button, please do leave a comment, hit like, all those things do help. And of course, if you turn on notifications, you're gonna stay up to date on really cool videos just like this with the worst albums from the biggest bands, part one. And of course, with notifications, you're gonna get part two. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into this. As I mentioned, this is part one. We're gonna go from letter A through M. So we're gonna kick off right here with Aerosmith, Just Push Play from 2001. And that's just all their signatures. It's not scribbly scrabbly on there, but I did luck out and get to meet them, which you would think maybe would put this album over the top for me, but it did not. It's their 13th studio album, and it's just way too contemporary for me, adding drum loops and beats and all that sort of stuff in it. And despite the first single, Jaded, which I actually really, really enjoyed, there was just nothing else on the album that came close to that. And I feel there was a lot of missteps, too many different styles and things worked in here and just trying to be contemporary and case in point when they did the Super Bowl halftime show they brought out Britney Spears and so this whole album just a big turn off for me now I almost chose done with mirrors I am just not a fan of this I like the opening track let the music do the talking but that was a re-recording of a Joe Perry project song so I know there's a lot of people that think that was the last great Aerosmith album I'm not a fan of that though. Okay, moving on to the next one though. Black Sabbath, Forbidden, 1995, 18th studio album and last to feature vocalist Tony Martin. Now the weird thing about this one here is that it was produced by Ernie C from Body Count. He was the guitar player in the band. And I don't know why the label pushed that on Tony Iommi, except that maybe because Ernie C was a guitar player, they thought the two would connect or something like that. But it wasn't like the Body Count album had some amazing production or had even sold that many copies or anything like that. So just kind of strange in my opinion. There's also Ice-T on here rapping and doing things. And it's just a very weird sounding album. Then you've got really bad production on it. It's very muddied and stuff like that. There's a few standout tracks though on here. I do like Can't Get Close Enough, I Won't Cry For You, Kiss Of Death. So there's some good ones on here, but just as a whole, the album is not my cup of tea. Now I almost went with Born Again from 19, I think 83. And that one, there's a one a lot of people would pull up, but that's grown on me a lot in recent years. And even though the production on that one's not very good, I hear Tony Iommi is working on a remix for that. So maybe we're all gonna love it a lot more very soon. All right, next one up, Bon Jovi, Bounce from 2002, eighth studio album. In my opinion, they just tried really too hard on this one to update their sound. Uh, another one where they're adding the drum loops and the beats and things like that. It's also a post 9-11 album where they've got songs on here like United. And I think they were just trying too hard to make that connection. The lyrics for me come off as a little contrived. And I will preference this by saying at that time I was living in New York and I lived through 9-11, and maybe it was all just a little bit too close to me to be able to listen to songs like those, because I ended up feeling that way with a lot of them. LA Guns did them, Tesla did them. There were so many bands that put out 9-11 kind of tribute songs and stuff like that. And I've just never liked any of those, and that was a big turnoff for that album right there. All right, next one up, Alice Cooper, Brutal Planet from 2000. 
14th solo album from him. He took a much darker, heavier approach on this thing, a move into the industrial and to the real kind of heavy metal sound, uh, just darker, dirgier metal style that he was doing, which was contemporary at that time there. He had done metal in the 80s, but it was the more traditional style sound as opposed to what he did here. And I've just never clicked with this album, even though I know at the time, I think the critics liked it. It was kind of a return to form, and, or not a return to form, but I mean, it was an album that brought his name back and everything like that after some failed you know, stuff in the 90s there. But for me, at least, it didn't click. And to this day, they're still playing the song Brutal Planet in concert, and I've never warmed up to it. No matter how many times he plays it, I don't think I ever will. All right, next one. Def Leppard Slang from 1996. Sixth studio album from the band. Again, another one that is darker, heavier, it's slow, it's very dirgy, and it's also very muddy. The production on it is not very clean or crisp, in my opinion, what I would have expected, especially following something like Adrenalize, which of course followed uh, Hysteria. And again, no, it's not produced by Mutt Lang, and I know that's part of where, where this maybe turns off and whatnot. But you've got this darker, heavier album. And then on track three, you've got the song Slang, this sort of pop metal sounding thing that's almost rap on it. And it just doesn't fit on here. There's nothing else that's like it. Thank God, because I don't like this one track on here. And there were a few others on here that were really good. Um, I did like the first single, uh, Work It Out. I also like All I Want Is Everything on here. So a little bit in the middle was nice, but the book ending of this album just is killed by that darker, dirgier sound they were testing out and dropped, thank goodness, after it. All right, uh, one of them that I almost considered for that though was X or 10, mostly because they went and co-wrote with a bunch of people. And for me, this album is one of the least sounding Def Leppard-like albums on there where they were doing more of the boy band style stuff, but I had to go with slang. All right, uh, next one up, Dokken Shadow Life from 1997, sixth studio album, second one that was a reunion album, first being Dysfunctional. That one was on uh, their original label, Electra, and then they moved to a smaller label here. And this label, CMC Records, actually a number of the albums that I'm covering here, come from that label where I think that label won, just let them do whatever they wanted to do. But I don't know if they actually pushed them to try to do more modern style stuff because this album here moved right into the grunge sound. And by 1997, that was all over too. So it was a little too much too late kind of a thing. And I just don't get it. You don't have that trademark George Lynch guitar sound. Uh, Dawkins' vocals are okay, although sometimes he puts a filter on them. And it's an okay album. It just doesn't sound like Dawkins. It really never should have been under the name, in my opinion. Okay, next one. Kiss, Music from the Elder, 1981, ninth studio album from the band. I'm quite sure a lot of you would be putting that one in here, but I know there's a number of you that absolutely love this album. I just can't get behind it. The concept is weak. Uh, it features an orchestra in there that I don't think is used properly. It makes it sound very dated. This album sounds like it came out in the late 70s, not even 1981. It's just got a sound to it that, that puts it at a specific time instead of making it a timeless thing here. Now again, there are a few good tracks on here and I think if they had rearranged this album and they dropped that opening fanfare at the beginning, maybe it would have been better. But I do like the song The Oath and Mr. Blackwell. There's some good ones on here. Only You that was later covered by Doro. Um, but all in all, I just can't get through the album. There's too many low points on this that don't carry those good tracks throughout it. And another one that I was considering in place of that one was Carnival of Souls. Um, and I think this one was uh, 96, 97, somewhere in that range, maybe 98 even. Um, but it was recorded in 1996. And it, again, they just went full on grunge in it. Couldn't get behind it, but ultimately I can listen to that one, whereas I cannot listen to music from The Elder. Okay, moving on. Uh, next one up, LA Guns, American Hardcore, 1996. Fifth studio album. Uh, this one here was uh, 
featuring only Tracy Guns as the last original member in here. We still have Steve Riley on drums, but he was not the original drummer, and he came in after the first album. So I kind of, I mean, I call Steve Riley an original member, but I'm just being technical about it at this point. They did add new vocalist Chris Van Dahl, and this one here he treats like a hardcore album. It doesn't have any ties to the original LA Gun sound. There's just nothing like that. It's uh, kind of hardcore metalish. If you know of the Tracy Guns solo album, Killing Machine, that is exactly what this album is here. Should have been a Tracy Guns solo album, but they slapped the name on it because it would sell better. This is another CMC uh, Records or International. Um, release. Okay, this one here is maybe the most perplexing and the worst of them all, in my opinion. Lynch Mob smoked this 1999 third studio album. I don't even keep this one in the collection because it is just that bad. It is such a bad misstep. Uh, only featuring George Lynch, uh, of course, namesake still in there, but they added new vocalist Kurt Harper. And this one here is done in the style of new metal or the rap metal. And it's just like that LA Guns album. It doesn't have any ties to their past and why they would think that they should release it under the name when there isn't the vocalist in there tying it to it. There isn't the sound. There isn't the style. Lyrically, it's all different. Just everything about it, it should have been under a different name. Now, fortunately, George Lynch, who does a number of different projects, puts them out under different names instead of trying to keep them all under one thing. All right, the final one we're gonna wrap up with here, the 10th one for this part one episode, goes to Metallica Saint Anger, 2003, eight studio album. I know a lot of you guys wanted that one in here. Um, this one here following the band on a tumultuous period here that was documented by the cameras for the uh, Some Kind of Monster documentary. So we know what was going on and why this album is what it is. Uh, they decided to drop all guitar solos from it. And instead of making shorter songs that were three to four minutes because there was no soloing and stuff like that, they still have seven and eight minute long songs. And it's sort of just what's going on. I found it to be very boring throughout. Uh, they're also minus a bassist in here. Instead, producer Bob Rock is playing bass. So they're really down to three core members at this point, trying to find their way. Now, the album's not all bad. I really can't stand the first three songs on here. Frantic, St. Anger, Some Kind of Monster. Uh, James's vocals are just too raw and rough, and they don't sound right. They crack at certain times on it. I know they were going for this kind of real stripped away sort of approach and everything. But later on, there are some good songs that are in here. Dirty Window, Invisible Kid, Shoot Me Again, Sweet Amber. I do like them, but this album is in drastic need of editing and new production on it. And there are people that have gotten a hold of the album and remixed it, and it sounds a hell of a lot better. I really, really am hoping that they're gonna do that for the box set, but considering they didn't do anything with the uh, Injustice For All fixing the bass on it, they probably will not do anything. Metallica is known as a band who stands by whatever they do, no matter how bad it is. And so there you go. That is uh, 10 of the worst albums from the biggest bands. This is part one. There will be a part two. Keep an eye out for that tomorrow. As I said, I will be leaving a link in the description if you're watching this several days on from when it is posted um, but yeah do check back hopefully you've enjoyed this let me know what uh you know albums you think are the worst ones from the biggest bands that you follow let's go with just the uh, a through m right now because in part two we are going to pick up with m again and run through z let's save uh bands with those letters in it for that one all right everyone take care have a good one and i'll talk to you soon bye bye